uh, my name is Kaya Matheson. I'm a contemporary oil painter. And today I'm going to talk to you about building your creative community. What is it? How do you do it? Because, you know, you're probably going to come out of college for all these wonderful ideas. You've had this amazing support network. And then suddenly you're just out in the cold. So, you know, actually, it's quite straightforward. I always just think of it as think if you're going to have a party, what would you do if you were going to throw a party for your friends, you know? So, you know, just like narrow it down to small things. Don't sort of get overwhelmed by, oh, there's all these things to do. Uh, the first thing I would suggest is apply to open calls. That is something that's going to really get you flowing with a lot of different uh, uh, um, art fairs, maybe exhibitions that are out there. So that and there are open calls happening all the time. Definitely join Artist Newsletter. It's an absolutely invaluable source of information. Uh, also, your joining fee covers you for public liability insurance up to, I think, five or 10 million pounds. That's really extremely important. Uh, there's also another place called Curator Space. Um, and look for art submission websites and subscribe to them because, you know, the more information you have, you can filter through them and, you know, that you, then you can pick and choose what you want to do. Absolutely do an art fair if you can. That's the best way to expose yourself. Uh, I mean, the other art fair is amazing because it's only artists. It can be a bit pricey to do that. So it might be something you want to work to further down the line. But it's an absolutely essential way of getting your email contact list started and also meeting gallerists because galleries will go to pick up artists from there. Um, if you can't afford that right now, something that you might be doing in the future, absolutely, definitely join an open studio or create, have your own open studio. I mean, Brighton is amazing. It's got the most well-known open studios. You can, you can join with people to make it slightly cheaper and um, you can host your own. Uh, it's an absolutely amazing way to meet people. You just, you never know who's going to come in. Uh, there are often people coming and looking for talent for various different things. It can be television, it can be galleries, it can be people looking for somebody for shows, um, you know, clients for marketing. Um, and it's a really invaluable way of getting uh, an email list together. Always have the comments book and encourage people to write a comment. And at the same time, you can kind of say to them, oh, drop your email address. You know, I'm not going to spam you. It's just for newsletters and future events. Um, that's the best way to start compiling your mailing list because the mailing list is essential. The other thing you can do is you can subscribe to your favorite galleries um, so that you know when they're going to be having private views. Again, private views, in-person networking, it's a great place to start. You can also meet other artists there. Um, uh, and that's that's really important. Um, you can join a local art or music group um, in in actually in person. Another a great way to meet artists uh, to collaborate. You can join online art and music groups. I mean, there's a ton of them on Facebook. I admin one called Brighton Art and Music News, and that's just a site where you can just publicise anything that you're doing in the Brighton area. And if you can't find one, or you can't find one that suits you, make one. Just make your own thing. It's so simple these days. You can just literally set something up and people will find you. Um, what are the other things? So the other things are, you know, people network. Absolutely. You've got to be going to private views, exhibitions, gigs, events, network, network, network. Always, always take your business cards everywhere you go. Have them in your bag, have them in a pocket, have them in with your phone. Take your business cards everywhere. They are literally, you never know who you're going to meet. And, you know, it's, it's no skin off your nose carding people. I mean, I do a really sneaky thing. I never put my phone number on there. But obviously you can put your, uh, any of your handles, like Instagram, Facebook, whatever uh, media you're using. Um, I very cheekily only put my website because it gives me hits to my website. So if they want to email me, they've got to go there first. Um, obviously, um, you know, the important thing is to collaborate with other artists because when you're starting out, you know, you want to try and expose yourself to as many things as possible. Um, and, you know, the thing is, it can be difficult. Like, don't get disheartened if you 
if you apply to galleries and you don't get it, you know, sometimes you've just got to make this yourself. So you can absolutely hire gallery spaces or you can, I mean, at the moment, there are plenty of empty shops. You can go to the council. If you can't find an exhibition that you can join, just create your own. The, the council will have a list of empty places. You might be able to get a short lease for a small amount of money where you can set up your own exhibition. It's a great way to start. It doesn't matter if nobody turns up. It doesn't matter if you think it's a complete failure. It's all about learning the steps of how to do it because every time you do these things from your mistakes, you will learn how to do it better next time. And it's a great way to then become not only your own artist, but your own curator as well. Um, so what else? Um, I mean, advertising, you can, if you've got the funds for advertising, your local paper is always a great one. You know, if you're doing an event, and you've got a zero budget for advertising, always contact the news desk. I mean, the Argus is great. They always want news. If you put a good spin on it and you've got a unique selling point, they'll pick it up. Um, I mean, obviously there's online advertising. Please, please, please do not become obsessed with Instagram. You are not gonna make your money selling stuff on Instagram and any serious gallery will just not even look at you. So, you know, don't spend your time in the virtual reality because in reality, things are still happening. And, you know, that is just a, a clear path to mental torture. Absolutely, you can have a handle and a page and put your work up and put, um, you know, what your work in progress, but don't give your secrets away. I mean, you know, no, people are interested in seeing your process, but, you know, your process is something that you've built up through a series of experiments, you know, you don't want to just give that away for free. So make it interesting, make it concise, but don't give away too much and don't sort of bombard your, your page with too much stuff because, you know, any serious galleries will just want to see that you're, you have a bit of integrity about you. Um, also, it's just getting sucked into a black hole where, believe me, you're going to be needing to do your accounts, your invoicing, all of these other things, as well as creating your work. So... Don't get too sucked into that. Um, I mean, the main thing I would say about building your network is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate as much as possible. We all get ideas from other people. We need to bounce off other people. It's a great thing to do. It gives you great skills because you've got to learn to negotiate with other people. You've got to compromise, but you've also got to sort of integrate and, and find a sort of cohesive theme for you know, your intention and what you're doing. And it, it helps to make you a lot more kind of clear about what you're doing. Um, so yeah, that's just a few things. Um, I mean, I'm open to questions. I know there was a lot there and I talk very fast because you know, that's me. But um, yeah, if, if you want to go to questions, I'm happy to do that. Please don't be afraid to ask if you need me to repeat anything. There's a lot of information or if you want, uh, I mean, you know, any, any questions, even if it's, you know, not even necessarily related. Can I ask you a question? Yes, hello, how are you? Hi, I'm Mia, nice to meet you. Um, I just didn't catch the bit about collaboration. I kind of, uh, yeah, could you repeat that? Sure. Well, basically, you know, collaborate. Try and find other artists. There are loads of artists everywhere. Collaborate with as many people as possible. You know, the other thing about collaboration, not only does it help you uh, with your skills, you know, communicating with other people and bouncing off ideas, because what happens if you get a, a room of people that want to do something, say at an end event, an exhibition, you know, you will you'll come up with ideas that you hadn't necessarily thought about before somebody else will have an idea and actually a cohesive thing then starts to emerge also the other thing is you know there is funding there's a lot of arts council funding there's some public funding uh, you can try and get sponsorship you know so the more people that are doing something you know it's all helping you further your cause because doing something on your own whilst it's great because obviously you have total control over what you're doing it's really, really time consuming and quite exhausting. I mean, obviously when you collaborate with other people, be very clear about your roles. 
and uh, make sure that you delegate well because you don't want sort of the one person who feels like oh I'm doing everything and then they just burn out it's really really important that everybody has a clear objective of what they're doing and they're comfortable with doing that say for instance if two people really want to do the same thing that's fine they can co collaborate together but it's really good to get your sort of communication clear with other people and learn how to kind of navigate uh, net networking with other people and collaborating. Does that help? Yeah, so you mean like working on a, like a group project or so, like a- Sure. Uh, yeah, or do you mean like working in a in an open studio with, with other people or- well, either really but I mean mainly for um moving forward I mean obviously if you if you want to you're building your community it's always good to have a lot of different people around that you can bounce ideas off because everybody has you know different knowledge of of different avenues um there's also things that you find out like you know say for instance I don't know you're sending out newsletters because you've got a small email list and then you suddenly realize that oh my God, MailChimp are now wanting to charge me gazillions of bucks. And then you find out from somebody else, hey, there's MailerLite that you can use as an alternative, you know, things like that. So small things that really have a massive impact to kind of what you're trying to do. But yeah, I mean, collaboration is good for a lot of things, um, mainly uh, passing experiences. But obviously, if you, if you want to have an exhibition with a group of people, then the more people you have, the better it is, mainly because that the more people you have, the more audience you have, the more people there are to do flyering or, you know, other forms of advertising to help with setting up and transport and, you know, all the various things that you need to do when you come to doing sort of, you, you know, your, your end goal, final show. Okay, yeah, thank you, that's helpful. You're welcome. Come on, don't be shy. There's plenty of questions I'm sure that you want to ask. <laughs> I mean, you know, I started out um, with zero budget, you know, and I just, I just kind of thought, I mean, I, again, it relates back to what I said at the beginning. I always just think, well, if you don't really know where to start, like you, oh, everybody's thrown a party before. I mean, come on, you know. So you think, oh, what do you do? What are the steps that you need to throw a party? Well, you invite people, you have, get some drinks and some nibbles, you've got some music going, maybe some nice lighting. Like those are like basically, you know, very very similar to what you're going to be doing in a, in an exhibition. I mean, obviously there will be variances, but you know, it's still the same kind of criteria. So rather than sort of thinking, oh my God, there's you know all of these things I have to do, actually it's just simplify it down and don't get overwhelmed. Just think logically, like what's the most important thing and break it down into small things that you can di easily digest and manage. Um, and you know, you can, you can grow from that. I mean, you can do something small um, just as an experiment uh, and certainly don't get disheartened if people don't turn up or you know you feel it's gone badly it's you know it really doesn't matter everything is all about a learning experience um you know so whatever you do however badly or you know well you think you're doing it it's it's just it's generating the next thing because you know your goal which you need to have because you know obviously it's very difficult to score if you don't have a goal your your end goal needs to be kind of there and you need to be here, but still thinking about that goal. But it's steps along the way and it can be small steps. And, you know, always net, net, building your creative community and networking with people leads you on to, to different avenues, which you can choose or not choose to do. So it's all about having opportunities and you, sometimes you need to create your opportunities. So absolutely go to art events and go to private views talk to other artists that's where you meet artists if, you, if there's a private view and there's free booths you'll have an artist they'll be there um you know that's a great way to meet people always card people because if for nothing else even if they never want to speak to you again they may you know follow you on instagram and then you've got an extra follower that all helps you know what i mean so it's just um it's just about getting out there and in in the real world and doing stuff because you know, yes, you can do a lot of stuff online, but it's important to 
physically do stuff in the real world because um you know that it's still yeah. here <laughs> um Kaya, there's there's been a question on the chat about um could you define what an open studio is um leslie has kindly put in a couple of links but i don't know if you wanted to add anything Brilliant. Okay, so I mean, I guess you're based in Brighton. So in Brighton and Hove, every May has something called open studios or open houses. Um, and they are basically, I mean, what it says, people open their houses or their studios on uh, weekends in May. Um, and they can either be a single person who does, I don't know, jewelry, glass, sculpture, fabric, all sorts of crafts and art um, and people basically will just open their doors and the public, they, 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 they do produce a brochure, they've got a map, there's lots of different areas, there's beyond the level, there's five ways, there's Kemp Town, there's, so the, the whole map is split into different groups of open studios and open houses. And basically it's free, you can go in and you can have a look at all the wonderful things that people create. And it's a really good way to network um, and to meet people. I mean, obviously, you know, don't go there and talk to people endlessly for hours when you can see that they're busy and they're trying to sell stuff because the point for them is, you know, they are trying to sell stuff. But if it's quiet and there are people around, you will find some lovely, lovely people that are really happy to share their experiences with you. There might be people that have been doing open houses for 15 years and you know they know all the little tricks and they'd be happy to uh, expand upon that and to talk to you about that so that's a really good start so obviously may is coming up absolutely do that there's some amazing stuff out there for you to see so apart from anything else it's a feast for the eyes um take your business cards again because you never know somebody maybe you're doing i don't know weaving with plastic bags or something random and you get chatting to some, they're like, oh, I really like something like that. And, you know, so it can lead to other things. So that's basically what they are. Um, it's very clear that on the maps, they're signposted. People will have banners out there outside their houses. It's usually like an open house logo. So if you pick an area where it's kind of quite um, uh, defined, there'll be lots of it. I mean, the, the um, Beyond the Level is a really good one. I used to be in that one when I still lived in Brighton. And that's great because there are a lot of them really close to each other. So, you know, and a lot of them have tea, they have fabulous gardens. Also, it's a great way to nose around somebody's house. So some of the houses are fabulous. So, so I hope that answered your question. And I'm sorry, I don't think I can actually see the chats. So um, if you wouldn't, Sarah, that'd be nice if you could read them out for me. Thank yeah, you. yeah, that's that's the only one. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on it. So thank you so much, Kaya. You're uh, welcome. That's really useful. Um, Leslie, are you okay if we hand over to you now? Yeah, that's fine. Do you want to put up my um, yes. slides? Yeah, that'd be lovely. Share the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One second. Let me get them. Gosh. Or you can let me. Sh oh, you've done it, so that's fine. Uh, um, Um, there you go is that okay like that uh, yeah that's fine yeah, yeah just hide the sidebar if you can and then yeah. otherwise it yeah. it's confusing ah. there you go <laughs> so that was really that was really interesting um kaya thank you and i think um some of that i will probably go over again as i talk through this presentation um I was asked to talk about really about marketing for artists, but I also run an artist community. So I will cover off a bit of that as I go through uh, the presentation. So this is just some um, lovely, pretty images from some of the exhibitions that we've organized and private views and some of our artists working privately in their studio. So it gives you a feel of what it looks like being a, a working artist. So you can go to the next slide, please. So my name's Leslie Sams, as um, Sarah kindly introduced me. I have a background in finance and marketing, and I have a master's degree from Brighton University. 
and I found the founded is that a word <laughs> I am the founder um, of um, a contemporary art mentoring mentoring specialist business called Pure Arts Group. Pure Arts Group is a community essentially so artists join and become part of the community and all the people you saw in that previous photo are members of Pure and it's a great way to find your tribe and we have uh, members days where we go and visit galleries together and we have open days where we do make art together and we have on an online book club um, and monthly Q&As and such like so it's a, a lovely community that artists join and then they find people to work with and collaborate with. We also provide workshops, courses, programs, et cetera, for training. And we're, uh, we've won awards. We're CPD accredited. So everything we've done has been passed by various authorities and bodies. So that's my kind of um, background story. That's my backstory. Next slide. So yeah, so Sarah asked me to talk today, um, or um, the college asked me to talk really about marketing basics, but I will probably go over a little bit of what Kaya also mentioned as well, uh, just so for clarity's sake. So the very first thing um, I should say is that clarity is the most important thing. So I'm gonna run you through these basic steps here. Clarity, how to show up, talk a bit about algorithms, call to actions, be authentic, never give up, and knowledge and data, all of which Kaya has spoken roughly about in the previous um, conversation that we just had. So hopefully this will just put a bit more meat on the bones for you. So this will be how to start and how to find an audience. Now, I will acknowledge at this point that not every artist leaves university or training or whatever they do and wants to sell their work. I'm going to talk pretty much from the perspective of an artist who wants to go out there and sell their work today. But that's not the only route that artists take. They can go out there and want to build a reputation and build a body of work and work publicly, either funded by Arts Council or Her Heritage Lottery. Um, they might want to do projects, they might want to do publicly funded sculpture. That's all different routes. And there are a myriad of different routes that artists can take. I'm going to really focus in on if you want to leave uni and or college and start your own business and do it yourself. That's really what I'm going to look at today. But bear in mind that this won't be the route for everybody. This is just one route, one pathway. So next slide, please, Sarah. So. Before you start anything, pretty much in life, not just in, <laughs> in marketing, but pretty much in life, you need to get some clarity. What is your burning reason why? Ask yourself, what am I seeking to achieve and why does it matter? Why is it important to me? And then because we're looking at the perspective of starting an artist business, you the next question you want to ask yourself is, what am I selling and to whom am I, do I want to sell it? Kaya mentioned about USP and I'm gonna mention the word niche, which is pretty much in the same arena. When you start out with anything, it is better to niche down tight. So it doesn't matter with whether your end goal is to sell a broad range of everything to everyone, to start off with, you need to start very tight, very niche down. So you start to understand how it works. So you start to get some knowledge and learning about how things work. So you go in tight to begin with. Variety is not the route to success when you initially set out. So it's you could be an abstract painter who also does ceramics and makes 3D models and does some teaching on the side. That's absolutely fine. But you need to start off your business. You need to pick one. Pick one 
focus in on it tight and follow that. And then as you learn and grow, you can add the other bits on a bit like relayering an onion as opposed to peeling an onion off. So once you know your niche, you now and your segment, you need to make a plan because without a plan, you'll just flounder about a bit for a while. So next slide, please. So who is your audience? Who is it you're speaking to? So now you know your niche. You have thought I'm, I'm a painter. Um, or I'm a teacher, whatever it is you've decided. Um, you need to know who you're, who you're talking to. Because it again, you can't be vague about this. Because if you're vague, no one will think you're talking to them. So it's no good saying, oh, well, I can sell to everyone. Because then everyone won't know you're speaking to them. You need to identify them. You almost need to know the colour of their eyes, what they wear, so and what their buying behaviour looks like. So you need to really niche down on that as well. So what's their favourite supermarket? Well, you know, why do, you, why do I ask that? Why do I ask what's their favourite supermarket? Because you'll understand what their buying behaviour looks like if you know what supermarket they prefer to go to. And you'll understand what their budget looks like as well. So if they generally go to Aldi and Lidl and they're looking for a bargain, you'll know that's the kind of buying behaviour they have and that's their budget. If they generally buy in Waitrose or they even go higher than that and they buy online from individual farm shops or individual suppliers, you'll know that they're very interested in the authenticity and the, the route to market of what they're buying. And they've probably got a higher disposable income. Disposable income is what you earn, then what you have to pay out for your bills and what's left. The bit that's left is their disposable income. Some people will have loads of disposable income and other people will have a very tiny bit of disposable income. Doesn't mean if you go for the person with a tiny bit of disposable income, doesn't mean that that's wrong. Because it might be that they have a tiny bit, but they like to spend it on art. Whereas the people with lots of disposable income might just prefer to buy fancy handbags or go on fancy holidays. So don't discount people with a smaller amount of disposable income. It's just understanding their buying behavior. What do they do? What, where do they go in real life? IRL, you'll all know that. You'll all know that and that um, acronym, I'm sure. Uh, where do they go? Where do they hang out? What, what kind of events do they attend? Do they don't go to Glastonbury or do they go to the opera? What kind of coffee do they buy? Are they really fussy? Do they like illy coffee and they seek it out wherever they go? All of this gives you a, an idea of what they are as a person and then how you can formulate a plan to speak to them. Do they buy online or do they prefer to go, you know, to Amazon because they they like the ease and the, and the convenience? And again, then have you seen that they're, you're building up a picture of them. They like to buy their from online supermarkets and get their, their food delivered. And they also like to buy from Amazon. So they like convenience. They've probably got a bit of money, but they like it to be convenient. I'm going to come on to how to deal with those kind of people. And how do they talk about art? Do they go, oh, I don't understand it. I don't understand art. Or do they go, I'm really interested in how people find their ideas and how they get to make the work. And that really stimulates me. So all of this will give you information on their buying behavior. So when you start to make your plan, your marketing plan, you've got a better idea of how to create a marketing strategy that will get to that audience that you have identified as your audience. Next slide, please, Sarah. So here's some examples, because people always say to me, that's all well and good. Well, what do you mean? <laughs> So it's always good to give some examples. So again, as I say, this is not for everyone. This is just I'm being very, very commercial in this conversation that I'm having with you. And this is not the right route for everyone. But if you are wanting to go down a commercial route that sells your artwork, you need to understand, I what do you sell? I sell, and you need to state it so you know it. So it's your mission statement. I sell feminine style artwork to females 
for their bedrooms and bathrooms, they're avid readers and they like romantic films. Now you know what you know what you do and, and what they look like, you can create a marketing plan that will speak to them. They'll go, oh, this art is for me. And they will recognize it. Again, there's some others there. I sell horse portraits and sculptures to horse lovers um, and owners to celebrate their love and their passion for their animals. Now I have an artist that does this. <clears throat> he makes um, horse sculptures and he was like, I can't find any buyers. I was like, right, who, who are you looking for? I'm, well, people who like horses. So we got in touch with the jockey club and we got him a gig at Weatherby Racecourse. And he turned up with a piece of his work and an idea of what he could make for people. And he got three or four commissions because he knew what he was selling and what his buyer looked like. I have another artist who does sell delicate drawings of flowers and bees to garden and animal lovers so they can have the outside in. And... We've gone down a route where she's become a fellow of the Royal Society of Botanical Artists and we take her to places like Hampton Court Garden Festival and she sells thousands of pounds worth of art to people who love gardens. But if she went to try to do that online or she went to try and sell her artwork at an art fair where there are people who like cars, she's not going to sell anything. So that would be a waste of her time. So it is understanding where your, what your audience, what you sell, what your audience looks like and where they might be. So next slide, please. So once you understand that, it's showtime. Now you understand what you're selling, why, to who, and how to reach them and speak to them in a language that they understand. You can start to select the places you need to show up to start selling your art. So I uh, say, Kaya mentioned some of these already, but we're gonna just go through some examples. So create content for social media. And a very valid point that Kaya made, which is that don't go down the Instagram rabbit hole and get lost in that if it's not where your buyers are. Now I will tell you on Instagram, Artists love Instagram because it's very visual. It's easy to do. They can see instantly if people are liking their posts. But remember that it's OK if your audience to buy your work is other artists. Because predominantly on Instagram is artists. So if you do something like the artist support pledge where you, you set that up it's, um, and you can Google that. Um, Google Artist Support Pledge. It was set up during COVID and it's a, a plan of how you sell on Instagram. If you do that and you do really well or you have a massive mailing list and you do drops on Instagram that you just put out to your mailing, mailing list, it works. But it's got to be a strategy that you've identified works for the buyers for your art. And it's a very young Insta, um, audience on Instagram. So if you've got art that appeals to young people, Great. Put a lot of energy into it. Be focused. Create a website. Again, only if it works for your buyers, if your buyers are people who hang out online and are looking to buy online. If not, you can go onto things like Artwork Archive and set up an archive website for yourself that just lists your artwork and gives you a presence online. It, you can do it yourself. You don't have to pay a web designer six, seven grand to set you up an all singing, all dancing website if your clients don't hang out online. If they do, invest in a good website. Invest in a website where you've got the ability to sell online. And I'm going to come on to that when I go on to algorithms. Do you sell work that would make great prints that can sell on demand? And you can sell thousands of them. If you do, register with a print on demand out there. Do you, are you a photographer that makes amazing images? Register with a photo stock supplier and sell through them. Apply for local shows and group shows. So that's something that Kaya mentioned. So there are lots of open studios all over the country. You do have to be located in that space. So we have a gallery space in Warwick, for instance, and Warwick have a great, Warwickshire have a great open studios. So it's a great marketing tool. Open studios are a great marketing tool. If you want to raise your profile, get some credentials behind you and show in London, 
and you can afford it because it's not cheap, apply for some of the society shows. So some more acronyms for you here. SGFA is the Society of Graphic Fine Art. So if you draw, then submit your work to them. Try and get in, try and get as a member. They do drawing days. You can start to build a community and you can sell the RBA, Royal Society of British Artists. Again, they have a, a show at the mail. You have to pay to submit these to these shows and you have to pay to have your work professionally framed and you have to pay to get your work there and you have to leave it with them. So you have to have a certain amount of resources to do that kind of thing. Apply for online competitions and residencies. Approach an, an appropriate gallery. You have to do some research to find an appropriate gallery. There's no point going to, a, if you're an abstract painter, and go to a gallery that sells pr predominantly ceramics and um, sculpture. They're probably not going to be interested in you because they know what their audience buys. And so they don't want to take your work because they want to focus on where they're going to make money. Gallery is about making money. To expand your network, gather some insights. Um, you could teach a class, you could organize a group activity yourself, um, do something with a group of, it's really good after, after college and you need to do stuff with your college group. So that's another way to expand your network and, and do stuff. So step three, next slide, please. If your audience are online or you're doing anything online, you have to make friends with the algorithms. Sadly, it's a fact of life. Try and pick an audience that isn't so much online. Um, but if you do, speak the language of your buyer and ensure you include all the key search terms in everything you do online. Because if you don't, it is very noisy on the internet and you will be lost. So it doesn't matter if you have paid £10,000 for the most fancy, singing and dancing, completely super connected website, if you don't include key search terms that your buyers that you have identified will be using to find you. Because they won't. There are millions of websites on the internet and lots of big companies who have lots of money will be paying Google for Google ads and being put up in the top of the search engines. So if you want, don't have that kind of money and you want to get in front of your buyer and it is all online, make sure you absolutely maximise out on the key search terms all over your website. Be consistent. So you must show up regularly. You must update your website. It's a bit like a shop window. If you walked past a shop window in your high street, for a year and they didn't shut, change what was in the window, you would stop looking. You would say, oh, I know what's in there. I don't need to look. Same with a website. If you don't change your re website regularly, and I would say you need to put that into a regular habit of at least once a month, ideally once a week, then the algorithm will think you're a robot or worse, it will think you're dead and it won't show your website to anyone. So it doesn't matter how much you've paid, if you don't regularly go in and do stuff on your website. And a classic that I see all the time with people who do want to sell their work is instead of selling the benefits, they sell the features. You have to focus on your inspiration and motivation and what impact having your work will have on the buyer. How will it make their life nicer, better, their home environment better? How will it inspire them? How will it make them feel happier in their day? Don't focus on I sell square canvases that have multicolors on them or I make 3D objects. Tell them how it's going to make them feel once they have your artwork in their possession. Because that's what people, people buy a feeling, an emotion. That's what they want. Next slide, please. I will say at this point, I have very top lined all these slides. So obviously I could talk for about 20 hours. I'm sticking to top line information. So in a marketing plan, there is absolutely no point doing anything if you don't add a call to action. What you want people to do next. 
What do you want them to do? Do you want them to join your mailing list? Follow, go and look at your link in your bio if it's on Instagram. Visit your exhibition or event. Buy here. Add a hyperlink. Make sure that it's easy. Tell people what you want them to do. Make it super easy. People are really good at using QR codes now. Click on the QR code. If it's on a poster, if it's on a printed poster that you've stuck up somewhere in the real world, put a QR code on it and say, scan this code. Tell them in clear English what you want them to do. If you're selling online, make it easy for people. Get a Stripe or a PayPal account and make sure it's really easy for people to buy. The longer it takes people to buy, the more likely your sale will fail. So if you say, oh, yes, you can buy that, email me, they won't. Oh, yes, you can buy that. Go through these seven different rooms and eventually you'll find it and you can buy it. They won't. People are lazy. They want buy it here. Click on this link. Pay now. If you do that, you'll sell it. If you don't, if you create more hoops and for people to go through, they won't. I can tell you they won't. We do. We run. Um, we've had online selling platforms for at least 20 years. Since the Internet began, none of you will know. Remember that day. I do. If you're selling in person, register and get yourself a remote card reader. It's an app on your phone. It's a little box. It looks like your phone. It's a little box and people can tap their card on it. You can get them from PayPal, Stripe. You can get them from, I've got one from um, Zettle, it's called. I've got a Zettle. And when I'm out and people say, well, they want to buy something, I say, that's fine. I bring it up on my phone. I go on the app. I put the amount in. I say, that's lovely. Tap your card here. Zero points where they can stop and say, I don't want to buy. There is a lot around law that I'm not going to go into today. But if you go onto the Pure website and on the Pure Journal, click on the tune in um, menu item on the Pure Arts Group website, there is a journal there with millions of articles and that talks about law and there is law around selling. And if you sell online, you have to give people 14 days to return it to you. Be aware of the law. If they sell in person, it's different. If you're selling in person, it's different. But get go and find out more information on the law when you're selling. Okay, next slide, please. Keep it real, be authentic. And again, Kaya said this. Um, it's so exhausting, actually. And take it from someone who's been around for a while. It is exhausting to try to be something or someone you are not. It will eventually take its toll on your mental health. The whole point about working in your passion, being an artist and working in your passion is that you have good mental health, that you are one of the lucky ones. You have found something that you really love and that you do it every day. Don't then sacrifice that on the altar of Instagram or the altar of I am just here to make as much money as I can. Remember that life, good mental health is literally invaluable. You can't buy it and you should pr protect it with your life. You need to preserve your mental health. I am someone who had a, I had a nervous breakdown at 23 because I worked in a bank and I hated it and it was not for me. And it literally destroyed my mental health and it took me 10 years to recover. Don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. Be very mindful of anything that makes you feel Super anxious. Now, you can sit in that discomfort and understand it. But if it is going to destroy your mental health, don't do it. That is your health is something you can't buy. And you can't buy back time. As I say there, we're here for a good time, not a long time. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. Make sure that you have fun. When you work in your passion, it should not feel like work. It should feel like you're having a great life. And that's why we're here. We are miracles. It is a trillion to one chance about being born. You are a miracle. You have something amazing to share with the world. Share it. Don't sacrifice your mental health and your physical health so you can't do so. Next slide. That's a big one. There's a lot on my website about mental health. I am very 
concerned about our mental health. Never give up. If you want to be an artist, you are going to have to be strong. Never give up. Resilience keeps showing up is the key to everything. As I say, I had a nervous breakdown when I was 23. I've had three failed businesses. I have a very successful business now because I didn't give up. I just got up, brushed myself off when I had a little cry in the corner. I had a glass of wine. I went, right, what we're going to do next? Okay, have another go. Overnight success is a complete and utter myth. Never believe that all those people you see are successful did it overnight. They didn't. They took 10, 20 years to get there. Everything worth having is worth taking time to achieve. Baby steps. Don't rush. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy every day. Enjoy all the steps that you take. Don't rush at it. Next, next slide. And with marketing, back to marketing, make data and knowledge your friend. Every day is a school day. Watch YouTube videos on people that have done it. On a, we have a YouTube channel called Pure Art Live. You can find the link on our website. You can just find it on YouTube. Pure Art might be the other way around. Pure live art, sorry. <laughs> I'll send you a link. Pure live art. I, there are thousands of hours of me interviewing successful artists, successful gallery owners, people who have done what you want to do. Listen to what they have to say. There are hours of it. You can listen to all of what they've got to say and learn from them. Scroll on socials. Don't just post your stuff on socials. Scroll on socials and find stuff that's interesting. And then just go follow it. Allocate it as a, as a part of your admin time. Say for 30 minutes each week, I'm going to give myself permission to scroll on Instagram and find something interesting and follow it through. Ask lots of questions. Never be afraid to send an email to someone and ask them a question. It's their choice if they reply to you. I have emailed artist Tracy Emin, I've, I've messaged Damien Hurst, I've messaged Hauser and Worth, and I've said, I'm really interested to talk to you, can I interview you? And nine times out of 10, they come back and they go, hell yeah, What's, when do you want to do it? I messaged the girl, Morag Kaster, who won Portrait Artist of the Year on Instagram, and I said to her, can I come to your studio with a film crew and interview in your, in your studio? We're doing that in two weeks time. Most people are flattered and they want to help and they want to share because they know that that is the route to their feeling good about themselves as well as helping others. Stay curious. The minute you think you know everything, you have moved out of the humble space and people will disengage with you. Stay humble. Stay curious. You will never know everything. You don't even know what you don't know. I don't even know what I don't know. And I am significantly older than you. And there is stuff that's epistemology, the, the theory of knowledge. We don't know what we don't know. And we don't know that we don't know it until we realize we didn't know it. Keep asking. Keep showing up and keep asking. Thank you. For, I think we're on the final slide. Yep, that's me. If you want to, if you want to email me, you want to ring me, you want to carry on this conversation after today, just drop me an email. Call me, leave a message. You probably have to leave a message because I'm normally either mentoring and coaching, delivering a talk like this or out. <laughs> but leave a message or email me and I'm more than happy to carry on the conversation after today. And I'm happy to ask, answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. That was really um, useful and helpful. Oh, I'm glad it was helpful, Mia. And as I say, if anyone's got any more questions they want to ask, then please go ahead and ask them. That was very much centred on marketing and marketing in a very commercial sense. As I say, that is just one, that's just one route for an artist. There are many, many routes for artists that artists can take. Um, that's just one of them. Can I ask you, uh, what are some of the other routes? 
<laughs> so some of the other routes. So you could decide that you want to be famous. Um, and if you wanted to do that, then you would have to come up with a strategy that got you in front of people like Charles Saatchi and some of the big shows. And you wouldn't have a website and you wouldn't have an Instagram and you would just be in your um, studio making and just very much targeting a particular person and going after it that way. You could decide that you just wanted to work with people with special needs. And then you would consider how you would fund that. So you might go to an organization and who works with people, um, clients like that. So there is a um, charity called Rowan and they work with um, children with special needs and adult with learning dif difficulties and they are a complete art centric charity. So you might contact them and say, could I do workshops for you? You might design your own workshops and then apply for some funding. There are lots of charities that give funding to artists and you can Google this. You can Google find funding for um, charitable workshops. There are lots of foundations, um, Arts Council, obviously, but again, a bit like the internet, Arts Council is like the go-to easy one for everybody. So the chances of you getting Arts Council funding is very, very small percentage. So thousands of people apply and they give it to a very small handful. So if you've got resilience and patience, apply to Arts Council. If not, find another foundation that you can target that will give you, is more likely to give you small amounts of money. Uh, you can go to your local council. Go to your local. Um, so I know Eastbourne Borough Council and Rother District Council. Um, I'm not sure about Brighton. Have just been given twenty million pounds of, of levelling up money by the government. So they are looking for artists to do community work, and they will give them money if they go and pitch to them an idea. So that's another route. You might want to do public sculpture um, or murals. Again, you have to then go and say, why, do, Clarity, why do I want to do that? For what reason? For what purpose? And once you identify the purpose, there'll be a natural route to who you need to speak to. So think about the mural on the outside of the Towner Art Gallery. That was done as part of a competition and has become a permanent sculpture. And that was funded by Brewers Paints. So that was someone who did colourful things and a paint company sponsored them to do it. So that's just a few of them. There, there are endless, endless routes that you could decide. And then we would find a route to market for you and how you would do that. Have you got an idea, Mia, of what you want to do? Um. I have a few so I guess the, my first task is to kind of um, narrow it down to what niche I niche down niche down yeah, yeah one pick one yeah. yeah I mean one thing I guess that you were saying that I really kind of struggle with is being consistent with especially and I know you said like um don't do anything that's going to like jeopardize your mental health and yes and, and for me being on social media and like posting and even like just like social anxiety is like a huge thing which kind of gets in my way a lot I mean I've done art fairs and stuff where I've sold my work mm -hmm. but um like I would really like to do some workshops in the like charitable workshops in the future mm -hmm. and things like that mm -hmm. but I find it quite hard to like contact people and stuff like that Okay, so do you have a friend who's really confident? Yes. <laughs> okay, so why don't you buddy up with your friend who's really confident and say to her, you're really confident and I need you to help me. How can I help you in return? So what do you need that I might be able to help you with? Because it's all about finding strength in numbers, like Kai was saying about collaborating. So you become the sum of the people you spend the most time with. I'm sure you've heard that. Um, saying before so the five people you spend the most time with and our online is one of those things as well that becomes a person in this context so what I would say to you if I was coaching you is okay so you lack confidence in and social anxiety do you know what uh, Mia so do I and do you know how I got over it 
Well, first of all, I budded up with someone who was really confident. And then I just did it over and over again with them beside me. So I was like, I really find that really difficult. So can you just come with me? Hold my hand and we'll do it together. And then eventually I said to her, right, you're going to have to leave me because otherwise I'm never going to grow. So I'm going to do this one on my own. And she was like, okay, but I'm only around the corner. I was like, right, good. You go in the coffee shop around the corner and I know that I can come back if I need to. And I went and did the first thing that I had to do on my own. And I grew a little bit. I was like, wow, it was okay. And I didn't, you know, like they didn't shout at me or they didn't scare me. Okay, next time I'm going to have another go. But you still need to be quite close by because I might crumble. Did that. And I just gradually, and then I was like, okay, I think you can stay at home, but you need to be on the end of the phone. So as long as you're on the end of the phone, I know I'm all right. Go and do it. And I gradually realized that people are all right, you know. People are okay. They actually want me to do all right. They did, they weren't there trying to make me feel terrible. But because I'd had bad mental health, I thought that was what that was what they were there to try and make me look like an idiot, or to make me feel stupid, or to make me feel like I wasn't worth it. And so that's how I thought. The, that was my perspective. As I gradually grew, and this person helped me uh, grow by being around and being present and just being there to pick up potentially pick up the pieces if it went wrong I realized actually people aren't that bad most of them 90% of them actually want to help you and want to make you feel good about yourself and that was a a pivotal growth moment for me when I realized that look no is okay it's all right if they say no it's fine they can say no to me doesn't matter I can just go and ask somebody else. And there's this other thing that I do now with clients, which is go for the no. So I say, go on, try and get 10 no's. Believe me, you won't. Because one person will mess it up and say yes to you. So I have a jar, I give them a jar and I say, you've got to fill this jar with no's. So you've got to try loads of things and get no's in this jar. And it's and once you gamify it and make it fun and you're like, okay, if I get 10 no's, I'm going to reward myself with I know, whatever is interesting to you. So for me, it would be probably um, a nice coffee or I'm going to reward myself with watch, uh, reading a book or watching a nice movie on TV because I work, I'm a workaholic and I work too hard. So I try and find things that stop me working. I'm never going to get 10 no's. Believe me, I've never managed it. And that really helps with the sensation of growing. You're like, oh, I grew. I grew a little bit and I got a bit like more resilient. That's great. And I got, you've got to reward yourself when that happens. You've got to be proud of yourself. Self-love is so, so important. You've got to love yourself. And when you lose sight of that, that's when your mental health really does suffer. When you lose sight of self-love and self-worth. You're amazing. Look at your, I love your, um, it's like a kimono, isn't it? I love that. <laughs> Thank Show you. up in bright colours. Be seen. Be loud and proud. Get out there. You've got something really unique and special to share with the world. Be ashamed if they don't see it and hear it. Do it. And ask your best, ask your buddy who's really confident to come with you to begin with. And tell her, though, she won't have to come all the time and you will ask her to stop coming eventually. That's a good idea, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Does anyone else have any, me ask more questions if you want, but if anyone else has got any questions, I realise we got to one o'clock. <laughs> no, all good? Oh, thank you so much, Leslie. That was brilliant. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. For today. Yeah, I really you're enjoyed welcome. It. I really enjoyed yours and uh, Kaya's as well. Yeah. Hopefully. It was quite good. They were quite synergistic, weren't they? Yeah, I think yeah. the two of them were quite synergistic, which is great. It's all planned. I've got, I've got a little tip, what you were saying about, you know, if you're shy, that because I, I always was terrified about speaking about my work because it's really difficult when you start out. You pretend mm-hmm. to be somebody else who's talking about the work. And yeah. that really helped me. Yeah. Because sometimes your friends aren't available to come with you, you know, your confident friend. Mm -hmm. it is true talking about your own artwork is so difficult and so practice it another one is practice in front of the mirror get used to looking at your own face so (laughs) hard so hard (laughs) get comfortable with your own face I did that's how I got over it was doing all these recordings 
I was like, I hated having my photograph taken and I hated yeah, seeing same. myself on screen. I was like, right, well, I'm just going to have to do a thousand hours of it then until yeah. I like completely don't care. I think yeah. uh, lockdown helped that, didn't it? Yeah. We are suddenly <laughs> forced online. Let's yeah. go. Got to look at ourselves all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all the time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the lighting in his hair is terrible. I hate it. <laughs> I need to sort it out. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. And I hope those that came along today that were able to make it um, found it useful and, and enjoyable.